So the previous talk was really an overview of, you know, uh, deep learning as applied to sort of images and video. This talk is quite different. This is really a piece of research that I've been doing with uh, my stu grad student Matt Zeeler and uh, my now former postdoc Graham Taylor. Um, so it's all about deconvolutional networks, and this I guess embodies, you know, my belief about where you should be on that kind of spectrum I showed at the end. Okay, that balance between sort of learning everything and hand specifying everything in a model. So just to uh, make clear, that, so you know, even though I, I've been working on this, it's really entirely Matt's work. This is what Matt looks like when he's not hard at work uh, coding in front of the computer. So um, essentially, this model I'm going to be describing is a, a form of generative model. It's not actually probabilistic, but you can generate from it. Um, it's really uh, a convolutional form of sparse coding, but with some quite substantial changes to the basic sparse coding model. The, one of those most important changes is that we're going to have pooling integrated into the uh, model as part of the cost function. And that pooling is a special form with latent variables, which is essentially going to give a, a sort of decomposition into what and where. That is the sort of the notion of sort of some form of um, position and some form of appearance information. So this is on that sort of threshold, as I was indicating earlier, between having an explicit separation of shape and appearance um, versus you know having it all sort of combined it together, um, like you see in many uh, many deep models. Um, and one, uh, and so the point is that this, this pooling operation is going to be sort of critical to getting the kinds of invariants we want, and it's actually going to be sort of uh, trainable in the sense we can differentiate it and optimize it just like anything else in our uh, cost objective. And again, the objective here is to try and learn features for object recognition, as I was talking about last time. So just to give you uh, the overall structure is going to be, uh, we're going to just look at what happens in a single layer of the model. I'll then talk about how you stack it. Now, the, this, the model is different in the sense that the inference we perform with multiple layers is quite different to many other models. And I, one of the reasons why this thing, we think, does some interesting stuff. And then I'll talk, discuss how it relates to sort of existing techniques out there and then show you some experiments. So let's just look at a single layer of the model. Now, as I said, it's really um, a sparse coding model. So just to recap for all of you, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here. If you have, this is a patch-based version of sparse coding. What I'm going to describe is actually going to be convolutional sparse coding. Um, in a patch-based version, you have an image patch. You assume that you can represent that as a linear combination of a small number of little prototypes from some big dictionary. Okay, in this case, just these three elements here. Okay, and the the overall sort of um, cost function you write down is you want to take your sparse vector p, so p is going to be mainly zeros, in this case just three non-zero elements, um, and that's going to be multiplied by your dictionary matrix D, and that should reconstruct your input patch Y, okay, and that's an L2 reconstruction constraint, and you have some L1 sparsity penalty on the uh, coefficients of this uh, feature vector p, which keeps most of them um, zero and a few non-zero elements. And so at inference, all you're trying to do is just figure out um, what is the um, sparse vector p that, set that minimizes this cost function? Okay, so that's standard um, patch space sparse coding. At training time, you're also trying to estimate the dictionary elements as well. Okay, now, um, so to explain deconvolutional nets, it's easiest to start off by explaining the exact opposite, which turns out to be something you hopefully are much more familiar with, which is a convolutional neural net. Okay, so in a convolutional neural net, what happens? You take your input image, you convolve it with some learned filters, you apply a, an element-wise nonlinearity, and then you do some pooling, and then that gives you the feature maps for one layer. And then you repeat this for multiple layers, okay? And in this model, it's essentially, you know, feed forward, you're going from the input image, you know, up to the feature maps in a sort of, you know, nice series of closed form operations. It's supervised, that is that you're um, going, to, going to train all this stuff in here with sort of backpropagation from some label information at the end of the network. Um, and you're essentially, this is in that formulation I was describing earlier. You can think about this as a sort of encoder-only representation. This is the structure of one encoder layer. Okay, now in a deconvolutional network, everything is sort of topsy-turvy. Everything is upside down now. So we're, we're going to start off with some feature maps. We're going to unpool them using the various latent variables, which I'll talk much more about more later. And then we're going to take the unpooled feature maps and then convolve them with some learned filters, and that should reconstruct our input image. Okay. Now the um, feature maps, as we'll see, we're going to. It's going to be an overcomplete representation. So there's sort of many possible feature maps, settings of the feature maps that could 
reconstruct the input. So we have to have a sparsity constraint on there as well. Okay? Um, and it's unsupervised, so that is essentially all we're trying to do is reconstruct under some sparsity constraint. There's no, labels inf no label information required to kind of train what's going on in here. Um, and every, so the information flows in the opposite direction. So this is now sort of a little generator. You're generating the input going sort of down rather than going feed forward as you were previously in the ConfNet model. Okay? Um, and if you, again, this is, you can think of as a sort of decoder only model. There's no way to directly go from the input image to these feature maps. We actually have to do some inference to infer what, which feature maps you know, minimize the sparsity and still reconstruct nicely. Okay, so it seems a little bit uh, convoluted, but you'll see that there are certain sort of attractive properties to it as I explain it. Okay, so that's the sort of box diagram. So it has a slightly more fancy diagram that it has an input image that you present. These are your filters of the model. These are the things we're going to learn. Um, and then we have some unpooled feature maps. Um, so the, the filters will be parameters that are common to all images. The unpooled maps um, will be some intermediary representation we don't really care about too much, actually. Um, you, these are the feature maps you, you start with, and you unpool these using these latent variables theta to produce the unpooled map. Okay, and the sparsity is on these on, on the pooled maps here, which we're calling P. All right, and again, you, you're going to have to have some sort of sparsity constraint because there are sort of more elements in these blue. Um, maps than there are in the original input image. So there's an, it's an overcomplete representation. You need to somehow, uh, to give a unique solution, you need to have some kind of regularization, and that's what this sparsity term is going to do. Okay, so there's sort of two components. There's a sort of unpooling phase to get to the unpooled map, and then there's a convolution phase, which then um, you know, convolves and then sums to reconstruct the input. Okay. Now, um, so this, just to be clear, is a standard 2D convolution operation. Okay, you take this filter, you slide it across this map here, and then that gives you the uh, sort of reconstruction just from that feature map, and then you sum it up with the same thing from all of these. And you have multiple channels here of each filter because you have multiple color planes at the input. Okay? So that part's fairly straightforward. What's a little less um, straightforward is this unpooling operation. How do you unpool with these latent variables, and what, what are they, and what do they look like? Okay, so the idea is here that you have, there's your feature map. So each element in your feature map, in your pooled feature map P, corresponds to a neighborhood in your unpooled feature map. All right? And then accompanying that little um, uh, act activation in that particular location is a little Gaussian, i.e. this little thing here, parameterized with a mean and precision in each of the different um, axes. So it's an axis-aligned Gaussian. Um, you can't have a diagonal, but it can be axis aligned. So in this case here, you have a sort of, this is the what signal. This is telling you, you know, what do you have? So in this case, you have a small activation, and then this is telling you where it is in the neighborhood. Okay, so it's telling you that it's, when you um, plonk down the Gaussian, you get, you, get um, you put down essentially uh, some non-zero elements in these locations here. If you change the mean of your Gaussian, you can move around the position. So in this case here, we've changed to a different position within this neighborhood. So this guy here gets put down this location here. And this has a very um, high precision, so it's very small variance. So it's just like a delta. It's like a, essentially a max you can think of. Or if you wanted to represent a kind of more diffuse set of activations, you could have a low precision, i.e. high variance. Okay, so if you want to think about this as a pooling operation, by changing the um, precision of your um, little Gaussian, you can either do a sort of max pooling or a sum pooling, depending on whether it's low or high precision. OK, so the point is that um, we're going to be inferring both of these at each layer of our model, Okay, the feature maps and the unpooling variables. And this is essentially telling you sort of where things are. So this, the scale of the Gaussian is normalized. So if you want to change the magnitude of your feature, you can only do it with a watt channel. So this could be 0, or it could be some large value or something in between, this will always be some, you know, just uh, it's normalized to sum to one. OK, now one important thing is because this is a nice simple functional, uh, you know, par simple parametric form, we can take derivatives of this Gaussian with respect to some overall objective. So in other words, we can, it's going to be easy for us to sort of optimize these mu, uh, the mu and the gamma, the mean and the precision, with respect to some overall objective, not just based on some simple local measure of what's going on in this neighborhood, we can actually look at some overall objective function. So let's try and write that down. So the idea is that you have, um, just like in standard sparse coding, you have a reconstruction term and a sparsity term. Okay, the sparsity is going to be applied per element. 
All right, now we're not going to use L1 um, for reasons I'll, get, I'll show you later in the experimental section. Turns out if we just uh, take an element-wise square root, it seems to work better. Um, but uh, effectively, you just have some kind of sparsity penalty on the p's, keeping them uh, mainly off, but a few non-zero elements. Um, in the reconstruction term, so y is our input image. Um, our feature maps p, so these are really 2D feature maps, and we're going to have a whole set of them. Um, so it's really you can think about this as a sort of a 3D matrix, but I'm just writing it out here as if it were a long, big, long 1D vector. So I'm just, just for the, um, convenience, I'm writing this equation. Um, and then we have the two operations I've been describing uh, represented by this U and F operations. So the U operation is the unpooling, parameterized with your, the layers, those latent variables theta. So now as you take your each feature map K, uh, and then you unpool it with um, your latent variables to give you some unpooled feature map Z. And then the um, convolution operations are embodied in this um, matrix F. So that takes each of those unpooled feature maps, ZK, does a 2D convolution with um, your, uh, your filters, FK. And then you sum over all feature maps to make your input image. OK, and that reconstruction, Y hat, should be close to your original input image under an L2 norm. And then finally, this lambda just controls the balance between the reconstruction and the sparsity. So this is a hyperparameter that we have to tune in the model. So just to be clear about what you're inferring for each image separately and what you're learning that's common to all images. So in red here, I'm showing um, the things you infer for each image. So you infer the feature maps and the switches, the latent switch variables, theta, um, for each image separately. Um, but then the filters, that is, are going to be um, common to all images. In other words, your feature maps and the unpooled one, zk, those will be unique to a given exemplar. Um, and then fk will be the parameters. So it, it, uh, it, in, during learning, we're estimating both, the Z, you know, both pk, theta, and the fs across, uh, p, the th pk and theta across all training images, and then the fks. And then at test time, all we're doing is the fks are fixed, and we're just inferring the, the feature maps p and the uh, latent variables theta. OK, so how do we go about doing that? So I'll just, I'm going to describe the learning of the filters later on. I'll just describe inference. So in inference, all we're doing is figuring out the, uh, the what signal, the feature maps, and the where signal, the, the latent variables for the switches. So the feature maps, what we're doing, we fix the convolution filters and the pooling latent variables. And then it is actually a standard form of convolutional sparse coding that we're dealing with. And if you, you can then, we can borrow those algorithms from sparse coding that all the clever applied math people have worked out. And um, one that we find works is pretty simple and works very well is just this thing called ISTA. So all you do is alternate between essentially taking a gradient step on that reconstruction term, which is quadratic, so it's very easy to, to, uh, to compute the gradient, and then um, a gradient step on the sparsity term, which corresponds to, in fact, a shrinkage operation, if you're familiar with that. Now, one thing, as, as I'll describe a bit more later, we do project these feature maps to always be positive. We found that actually having positive-only feature maps does help quite a lot. Um, so um, these operations, of course, both of these don't in any way, they're unconstrained, um, they're not forcing positivity, so we do an, an explicit projection to non negative So anything that's basically less than zero, we just clip to zero. Um, so if you just then iterate between these steps, that in fact will optimize um, this objective here for a fixed f and a fixed theta. Um, so that's uh, fairly straightforward to do. Um, to optimize the, for the pooling variables, that's a little more intricate. Essentially, what we're doing now is we're fixing the feature maps P and the convolution filters. And what you have to end up doing is essentially you end up computing a sort of chain rule derivatives to the parameters of that, that ga each, the Gaussian of each pooling region. Okay? Um, the, uh, the equations for doing it are rather sort of nasty and don't really give you much insight into exactly what's going on. But essentially, the, the key point is, is that that uh, parametric form we're using for the unpooling is differentiable, so we can then differentiate through it to figure out what the optimum theta should be that would minimize this objective here. OK? Yep. Can you just say again, for the unpooling, are you just multiplying the feature map by uh, an unpooling vector? So it goes to all of the, uh, the, the Gaussian neighborhood? It's not just a? That's, that's right. So, so the Gaussian is, is, is normalized to sum to 1, and then you've got a, a sort of scale factor which is coming from the 
from this element here, from the, from the watt signal. Uh, yeah. OK, so what we're going to do then, doing inference, you're going to sort of alternate between these two, because clearly they depend on one another. So you're then going to have this sort of outer loop, which alternates between updating the pooling variables, updating the feature maps, and so on and so forth. OK, and, each, and the whole time, you're trying to minimize that overall cost function that you saw on the previous slide. OK, so let's show you a little example here. So hopefully you can see this. Um, so here's an input image. Um, here are the feature maps that we end up um, inferring. So you can see that there are 16 feature maps here. Um, so there's a few elements on in each of them. Um, some of them have none at all, in fact. Um, and then this the unpooling operation takes each of the elements here and puts them down using a Gaussian. So you can see that some of them, just um, this, this one here, stays basically pretty, looks like a little horizontal line now, a little two pixel line. So in this case here, the pooling neighborhood is only two by two. So it's a very small pool, un unpooling uh, neighborhood. In other cases, it's a bit more diffuse. You see slightly larger blobs being formed here. So that, that's uh, essentially depends on the parameters of those, uh, those Gaussians we use for the unpooling. And you take these feature maps, and each one of these is going to be convolved with one of these little filters here. So you can see there are 16 convolution filters. And then you sum, and you get some reconstruction. So um, there's, a, I'm not quite sure why this thing's so much dimmer. It's, it looks a deal brighter on my laptop. Um, the, uh, so yeah, the, the absolute magnitude isn't, I think there's been some sort of um, contrast change or something when I made this slide. But the thing should basically, you can see it basically captures the same uh, shape as the uh, input image. OK, so um, the, and the key point here is that you can see that I've color coded things. So uh, each of these, uh, wait, do I have it in the slide? Ah, OK, no, OK. Um, so the, the one point to make here, and this is what I made in the previous talk, is that it's important to realize that there is a sort of sparsity acting on these feature maps. So it wasn't shown on the previous slide. So there's some sparsity penalty that's trying to keep as few of these guys on as possible, OK? So that when you, you know, but it still must reconstruct um, this thing, which should be close to the input image. Um, now, as I was saying, this basically is bringing the element, these elements into competition with one another. So if you just, again, the same idea that if you look at this little piece of the uh, digit here, you can see that uh, you probably can't see because the contrast is not very good. But there's actually only one element that's now on, um, whereas in the, in the zone that would sort of reconstruct this, all the other elements are off. Okay? Now, if you look at these filters, if you just took these filters and naively applied them to this um, image, or sorry, this is the input image here, several of these guys would actually light up. So for example, this one's quite similar in orientation to that one. So you would, the fact you don't see anything in this little neighborhood here is because the sparse coding has, the sparsity term here has suppressed that. So that's this, this idea of kind of introducing competition between the features that I was talking about previously. OK, um, so yeah. So in practice, if you, know, if, you, if you run the sparse coding carefully and use enough iterations, you will see these nice sparse feature representations being produced um, with just only a single activation per, typically per location across the different feature maps. Now, just to give an idea what this, this, the, those latent um, unpooling variables are doing, so here's a whole series of different reconstruction examples of, the, of MNIST digits. Um, these are the raw coefficients we're using uh, for the filters. Okay, and what would, I'm showing here are little image patches um, that come down from uh, different activations in the pooled feature maps. So what you'll see, if, so this guy here, for example, with the top left setup is, the, is comes through this little filter. And so what you're already seeing is this guy convolved with Gaussians of different width and, um, um, and also slight positional offsets too. And so this is why you see small variations in the actual appearance here of this um, little template, if you like, that you've learned. In other words, for, for each, so this, each of these corresponds to a sort of a particular structure, a particular patch rather, from a different input example. So you can see that for, um, let's just find it. So let's look at this little um, sort of corner type structure here. The point is you don't exactly see this corner in any given input image. In, each different, in many different input images in training, you're going to see slightly different corners. Okay? And because those pooling variables can change, what's effectively happening is you can reconstruct now slightly different versions of this corner according to the different, you know, um, instance that you observe. Okay, so effectively, this is giving you invariance here to small deformations of your input signal. Okay, so this just because so this is a pixel space representation um, of the of different 
feature activations from different training images, okay? And, but just grouping them um, according to feature map. Okay, so that's, um, that's what happens in one layer. And you can see at the moment we see small, only small sort of invariants going on. But the, of course we're looking at quite small structures. Each of these filters is only five by five. So we're, we're sort of composing these input, is, these, each of these examples from a whole series of little five by five um, or thereabouts um, little uh, patches. So what's more interesting, of course, is when we go to multiple layers, what happens then? So the, just as in all other deep models, we're basically going to use the, um, going to stack the layers on top of one another. So the pooled maps are now going to be inputs to the layer above. So previously we had different color channels, and now you can think of the, the pooled maps from one layer being the sort of color channels for the next layer above. Now one difference is we're going to be able to perform joint inference over all layers simultaneously. Okay, and this is something you can only do with differentiable pooling. Okay, so often all that happens is you're just going to simply um, optimize, you know, say the second layer so that it reconstructs the output of the first. In our case, we're going to have a sort of global objective, which, which means we can optimize what's going on in the first layer as well as the second um, during inference. So, and the overall objective is always to reconstruct the input image. Okay, so we're not just interested in reconstructing the layer beneath like happens in many models, um, we're interested in going all the way back down to the pixels in the input image. So the problem is when you have a really deep model, it's like you're building a big tower, and of course the higher layers of the model are very remote now from the actual input pixels. But by sort of always tying things back to the original input, rep, input signal, it's giving us, it's, you can think of it sort of attaching guy ropes to your tower, which kind of anchors it um, back to um, the input. And in practice, we find it's pretty essential for learning um, Nice representations. OK, now one thing to point out here is we don't, this model, can, when we stack it, um, there are no explicit nonlinearities going on here. There's no sigmoids or tan H's or anything like that. The things which make this model nonlinear in, in its behavior are the sparsity constraint and also these pooling variables. OK, so the, if, you ch if you change the pooling variables, it's going to change the behavior of the model. If you condition on the pooling variables, then it is in fact linear in terms of its reconstruction. OK, so just a, this is just a little pictorial representation. So there we go. Each of these guys is now a different um, input channel to there above. So you can now, each of your filters now has four in this little toy example, four input planes. Um, and for the second there now has more feature maps, but they're smaller and so on. Um, OK, so this is a sort of schematic as to how inference works in a two-layer model. So what we're interested in doing is trying to make sure that we are reconstruction from, in this case, from layer two features here. This, these left two features, P2, all the way back down to the input image. The reconstruction should be close to our original input signal. But then we also have the sparsity term on here, which is going to constrain these features to be sparse. And during multilayer inference, we're going to be inferring these features here, as well as the, the, the latent variables in the unpooling at both layers beneath. Okay. Now, one important point is we're not going to be enforcing sort of sparsity on these intermediary features. So as we come down here, we're going to go directly through here. There's not going to be an extra constraint that these ones should necessarily be sparse. So that's something which um, we could put in and we've thought about, but it greatly complicates the inference. So as it stands at the minute, as you'll see, inference is actually very straightforward. And even if you have you know, four layers in the model, you can still do this inference quite fast because you're not sort of troubling too much about imposing sparsity in these intermediate layers. So let's just see how it works. Effectively, to update the features P2, what you're going to do is you're going to um, basically reconstruct all the way down to your input signal, to the input doma um, signal domain here, to give your reconstruction y hat. And the point is that if you, if you fix the unpooling switches, then this unpooling operation is uh, just a linear operation, as is the, the convolution and summation. So both these are linear. And the same is also true for the first layer. So this whole fit pass is actually one giant linear, linear operation to reconstruct. You can then compute your error, which is just the difference with the input signal. And then the, it turns out that computing the, the, the gradient on these guys just consists of propagating that error signal E just um, back up again. And because this was linear, so is this operation. So this is, again, a very quick operation to do. It just consists of running through your unpooling, then doing your filtering and convolution, your convolution and summations, doing that again, and then computing error, and then doing everything kind of in reverse. So here you're convolving with the flip version of the filters. Here you're pooling using the, the parameters of the Gaussians that you used on the way down, and so on, all the way back up to P2. 
and then you take your gradient step on the features, and then you shrink. You, um, this, is, this is actually the shrinkage for an L1 sparsity. For L0.5, it, it's a little more complicated, but basically it has a, um, a simple form as well. Um, and then once you've done all that, then you need to update these pooling switches. So the point is, of course, that um, you know, these guys greatly affect this reconstruction pathway. So what you need to then do is you can essentially, um, for both, for P, for theta 1, you're effectively going to look at the signal here and the signal there, and that's going to give you a sort of gradient to update these pooling switches. And similarly, if you update these guys, you've got the features P2 here, and you'll have some signal for Z2, and then you can update theta 2. Okay, so, um, and then you're going to use sort of chain rule you know, through the Gaussian to figure out how to update the mean and the covariance. So in both cases, you're combining basically a top-down um, signal with a sort of bottom-up error signal that's coming from beneath to figure out these parameters. And you're going to alternate these two steps here, like so, um, until um, you converge to something. So that's the multilayer inference. In the learning of the filters, so that is learning these, these bits here, the, the, the pink and red arrows, so that's essentially, the idea is you're going to run inference for all your training images. That gives you the feature maps and your pooling variables. Um, then if you, the, to update the filters, it's actually an over-constrained least squares problem. So we don't have any explicit cons, um, uh, you know, term in the cost function that penalizes the, the filter coefficients. So you can use conjugate gradients, which is very quick and work, converges very nicely. We do the afterwards then reproject to unit length and to be positive, just because we want to have everything in the model positive. Um, one slightly annoying detail is that we, we do end up having to learn these filters layer by layer. We did try just throwing everything in and just letting the filters um, do ma magic, you know, try and train all the filters jointly. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to work very well, um, which is a bit uh, annoying. OK, so just understand now what, looks, what a two-layer model looks like. So here's a, in our little MNIST model, there are 48 feature maps. Here you can see only three of them are on. And I've color coded them um, to correspond to the, each the color. This, you can imagine each one of these is painting with a certain colored ink. So for example, this little dot here reconstructs this portion you see in pink here. And this one here constructs the sort of funny arc for the, uh, the tail of the two. Um, the, uh, this is the second, these are the second layer pooled maps. If you unpool and then go down to the first layer, then this is what the, the first layer reconstructed maps look like. And then you, again, pass, unpool again and pass through the uh, first layer filters to get back to your input. But you can see the point is now that you've got only a few, very few feature maps are actually on, and they're still reconstructing the input signal that you see. So this is just a, a this color visualization uh, is just for one digit here. But if we look at this across a whole, you know, a whole range of different exemplars, what you can see is that um, we're using, seeing the same colored ink, that is the same feature map responsible for, for reconstructing the same kind of structure in different examples. So for example, you can see the sort of loop of this nine, or the loop of the six seems to be correspond to the cyan one, or the loop of the eight. Um, then you can see things like um, this little, um, Let's see, the, the five and one of these threes. You can see our pieces of the, this arc here and this arc here is all being used using the same. Oh, here we go, sorry. This, so there you can see the, the lower part of that three and that part of that five is using the same feature map. Um, so this is with the two layer model. If you, go, if you just do the same thing with the one layer model, it's much more fragmented. Obviously, everything's looking at a much smaller neighborhood. So it's a little less clear kind of, you know, the grouping that goes on in this. Um, Perhaps a better way of visualizing it is to do this, the trick thing I did previously, but this is now for the second layer. So now if we look at these second layer features, we can see but you're now going through two layers of this unpooling, each with their own set of, you know, in each, each of these little exemplars here is going to have a different set of, different mean and different precision on each of the layers. So you can now see, you can represent quite complicated little transformations of your original input signal. So you can see, for example, you can thicken the edge of your stroke you want to vary, you know, some of the digits have thin brush strokes, some of them have fat ones. Other times you can sort of, you know, change, for example, you know, how open or closed the loop is of your digit and things like that. So you can start to see sort of quite complicated invariances here being captured by the model. So this is, these are really being, um, these are embodied in those latent variables of the pooling variables. Okay. So, um, so that's really uh, the model, uh, the overall model. If this is the overall, this is a pseudocode for it. So you can see here, um, effectively, we just have, you know, for each layer, we're going to run a certain number of e epochs, different passes over all the data. Um, 
This is you loop over each image. You have a certain number of um, sparse coding iterations per image. This is you basically reconstruct down to the input from your current set of features, P, compute your error, propagate back up. So this is all very quick. These are sort of linear operate. These are simple operations you can put on a GPU to run very fast. We have some way of autom automatically estimating the step size we should take in our gradient, um, in our gradient update on P. We we'll then do our shrinkage and then project P positive. So that's the update of the feature maps, and this is the um, uh, switch updates. So we do that for each sparse coding iteration. And then once you've done this, this is, after you've run for over all images, typically we actually do this in a bat in batch form. We don't we don't necessarily run on. Sorry, we use. Um, Stochastic gradient descent on batches, so we update the Fs after, a, you know, say 30 different running inference on 30 different um, images. So then you update your filters and then project to be unit length. Okay, so that's it's pretty simple um, in terms of the pseudo code, uh, and indeed you can actually make the, both the inference and learning run re at reasonable speed. It's still not as fast as we'd like, but it, it is possible to make this whole thing run um, relatively fast. OK, so I just want to uh, take a step back and now look at how this relates to existing models. So the most, I think, the most um, important, closest relation are really these um, couple of papers where they try to do this explicit what-where separation. So this is a recent paper by uh, Jeff Hinton and colleagues where they're, in this model, they decode a part here. So they have an encoder in red and the decoder in green. The decoder really is actually doing very much the same thing as we're doing in our model. Um, so these little uh, delta x and delta y bits here, you see, those really are corresponding to kind of the means in our Gaussians that I've been talking about. They also have an encoder here, which will try and predict the, 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 Gauss, the parameters of the Gaussian. So we don't have that in our model, because ours is a decoder-only model. Um, there's another um, cool paper um, by uh, uh, Carol Greger and Jan Kuhn, which had, again, this, this idea of, again, a what-where separation so they would have position cells here, which would, would be allowed to change fast when watching some video sequence. And they would then have um, some cells which were sort of constrained to move much more slowly. This is close to the idea of sort of um, slow feature analysis, if you're familiar with that. Um, and this would uh, essentially learn, again, that this would be the sort of what signal, and this would, these would carry the sort of where signal. And these would interact in a sort of three-way um, uh, three operation which is someone, effectively in our model, our sort of unpooling operation is doing this kind of thing as well for us. It's taking the, the what and the where signal. So, um, so these are sort of deep learning type models which are trying to sort of do this separation between what and where. Um, there, there are other sort of models which try to do convolutional sparse coding. So in previous work, we looked at that. Uh, Corey um, and um, Pierre Semenet and Jan and others had a, a, a paper doing this. Um, some other folks at Duke have also uh, have a model which uh, is essentially doing something very similar. But it's quite hard to train these models for more than two layers when you, when you don't reconstruct all the way down to the input image. And that's one difference of our model with respect to these previous approaches. Um, there are some approaches we have which do reconstruct, you know, from what, you know, even from quite high up layers in the model all the way back down to the input. So the most notable of these is the deep Bolson machines, which I briefly mentioned in my previous talk. So um, I guess you're going to hear more about these from um, perhaps Russ Lunikoff when he, he talks. Um, there's also an interesting paper from Andrew Ng's group um, where they tried to do, they, it's a little bit different. They had a kind of feed forward network to predict what was going on at the higher layers of the model. Um, so they, in practice, they had some mechanism for sort of linking the input signal directly to what was going on at sort of higher layers of the model. So as I say, you know, the, the fact we're sort of doing inference here all the, all the way back down to the inputs image is something which is also going on in these models as well, but, by, but does, certainly doesn't happen in um, many other deep learning approaches. Okay, so let's look at some experiments. Um, so in the, we ran on MNIST digits. So in, fact, in the little models I was showing you, there were just 16 filters at the first layer, 48 at the second. Each of the filters were just five by five in size. There was two by two unpooling um, between the layers, oh, sorry, within each layer. So um, Effectively, this 5 by 5, of course, will be much bigger um, when you project it down to pixel space because it's, it's coming from layer 2. Um, the, we were using 50 iterations of sparse coding per image during inference. Um, and as I said, because everything's quite convenient to implement on a GPU, this translates to about 100 frames a second. So it sounds impressive, but those eminence digits are really tiny. In practice, that doesn't, isn't quite as amazing as it sounds. Um, we didn't do any unsupervised training. Sorry, sorry, it's purely unsupervised. There was no fine tuning. 
of the network afterwards, we just took those feature maps, those sparse feature maps I was showing you with the little colored boxes on them, and we just you know, um, essentially threw them into a linear SVM. OK, so um, there's various thing, sort of interesting sort of experiments I'm going to show you. Uh, the first one was simply comparing to sort of standard max pooling. So if you can take those unpooled feature maps, you could just do a, make a local decision, just take the largest element in each of those regions, and then pass that in onto the pooled map. And you can just store the location of the max. Um, so that, um, if you can, in contrast with the Gaussian, so the problem with doing that is you're just making a sort of local decision about what signal you should keep around at each, um, in, you know, from in the pooled map from the unpooled one. When you're doing the Gaussian, you're directly optimizing an overall objective. So you're really sort of optimizing an actual cost function rather than, rather than making some local decision. And this definitely makes a difference. So if you, the simplest thing to look at here, are these two black lines. So this is, an, this is iterations of sparse coding. Um, and this is the sort of cost, and the average cost per image of your objective. So this is your objective function here. You're trying to minimize this. And you can see you just end up with a much lower objective if you use your, the Gaussian pooling versus the max pooling. Um, now, this difference may not seem too dramatic. One thing you, of, we, you often want in this is you do really want nice, sparse feature maps. And we do see empirically, so obviously this thing is optimizing some um, sparsity measure as part of this uh, overall cost function, be it L1 or L0.5. It turns out, though, that you know, L0, which is really how many elements are on in the feature maps, that when we see models that we seem to work a lot better are ones that have a much lower L0. In other words, only really a handful of elements are on, and when they're on, they're on strongly, versus ones where a whole load of them are on sort of half the time. So, if the, if, uh, so in the blue curve, I'm showing here the difference in the L0 sparsity for the two different models. So when you use the Gaussian pooling, the L0 sparsity is way, way lower than it is for doing um, the max pooling. Okay, so the max pooling here is that on average, you have 85 elements that are on for each tiny little MNIST digit. If you use the L0 sparsity um, with the Gaussian pool, sorry, if you measure L0 sparsity with Gaussian pooling, you can see you only have about 10 um, elements on in your feature maps in layer two um, on average, which is you know, much, sort of, you know, almost a tenth of the number of elements you have with max pooling. So in other words, it's really helping you turn off many of those elements. And that actually, and it also helps classification too. So if you, in layer two, just going from max pooling to Gaussian pooling doesn't just lower the cost function and lower the sparsity, it actually lowers the classification rate as well by some quite significant margin. Um, so the next thing is uh, to look at is, you know, how much does this joint inference really help you? So one thing you could do is you could infer, doing inference, you could infer layer one, fix the parameters of those Gaussians, and then just inf you know, keep those held fixed and infer layer two. And if you do that, you get sort of 1.4% on MNIST. If, on the other hand, you allow inference to occur on both layers simultaneously, so you infer the switches at both layers and the, the features at the top, then you can see you actually get quite a um, significant reduction in error. Okay, so this, this is really telling you that you know, those high-level switches, or well, the high-level information should, can help you, can help set those um, low-level switches at the first layer. So when you do this, these guys are just set without any knowledge of what happens you know, at, a, at a larger scale in the model. So this is why it doesn't work as well as this. Um, so one other interesting, uh, a different interesting observation is that um, during inference, having t making the feature maps too sparse does seem to hurt you. So here we're, we're just showing the number of sparse coding iterations and the error rate on MNIST. And you can see that the error rate goes down, goes down, goes down. And at some point, as you keep iterating here, of course, the feature maps get sparser and sparser. At some point, they seem to get too sparse, and then performance decreases. And this is actually an interesting observation that sparsity seems to be critical for learning, for learning good representations. But it's not clear that you want to be super sparse when you're doing recognition. So one or two other people have um, noticed this as well. In fact, um, with just with standard sparse coding, it also seems to be true. You might think, well, maybe it depends on the, the hyperparameter that controls the strength of the sparsity. Um, so we've tried varying that as well. And you can see, in fact, you end up with fairly similar um, minima. So you, again, if you just, even irrespective of how strong the sparsity term is, if you iterate too many iterations, it seems to hurt during um, inference. Um, another interesting plot here would be, so on this note, you might say, well, 
if I vary the norm I use for the sparsity, does that make a difference? And the answer is yes. So the reason we use 0.5 in training is that it does seem to actually help. So these, this solid black curve here does better than um, this curve here, which is just using L1. But it's, what's interesting is that um, if you try using, you need to sort of use the same sparsity in training and the same um, sparsity norm both in, uh, during learning and during testing. Otherwise, it messes things up, is the sort of lesson you can draw from this. And this is varying the strength of the sparsity term during inference. So you can see it's, it's consistently better, despite the very, for whatever sort of strength of um, lambda you use, you still consistently get better sp uh, results when you have, um, I'm sorry, I've just said something wrong, sorry. It turns out it seems to be better that you get better results when you have the, the aggressive sparsity during training and the slightly weaker form of sparsity during uh, testing, sorry. Um, so, again, so again, this is saying uh, you don't want to be too sparse at test time. Um, so one thing we did in this model was to keep everything um, non-negative. That is, you could, the elements can only be zero or positive. Um, if you allow negative elements in the feature maps and the filters, it turns out that irrespective of whether you do Gaussian or max pooling, it really seems to hurt. Um, so the non-negativity is actually an extra constraint on the model and does seem to help a fair amount, both learn better features, but it also gives you a lower um, error rate as well. Um, there's also a little trick we found. You might wonder here about local minima. So of course, you're doing all these different alternations, you know, updating one thing, holding the other ones fixed. Um, you know, can you fall into local minima? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, and one trick we find to sort of help with that is that periodically during um, training, if you just reset the feature maps to zero, um, while you're, you know, because you start off with some random set of filters initially, and then the, f the feature maps you infer are sort of, you know, optimal or near optimal for those kind of near random filters. And the problem is, is that if you're not careful, you get stuck in a local minima. So just by sort of resetting to zero uh, at some points during training those feature maps, then you actually, we end up learning better stuff. So on the left here, we see what happens when you reset periodically. On the right, we don't. And it's a little hard to see, but some of these features, some of these filters here, rather, end up looking like sort of block-like things in layer one. And in layer two, we end up with sort of blob-like things. If we don't reset, if we do do the resets, we see that these sort of develop into sort of proper, interesting, you know, complicated features, in this case, like a little loop or something. And it does seem to help classification as well, doing this kind of reset. Um, just to uh, do some comparisons to other techniques, so we, we, we don't use any fine tuning. We seem to get about the same result as Hong Nak Lee's convolutional RBMs um, and slightly better than uh, this original deep belief net paper. And we can actually sort of be we're sort of competitive with some approaches which do actually use um, you know, actual fine tuning with the labels of the network parameters as well. So this is actually you know, quite a good performance given that it was trained unsupervised. Jeff, oh, yeah, okay, just about to point out there's a better result that he's got recently or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. And this is a 1.25. Oh, okay. Thank you. I should, I'll change that after the talk. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, so all, so those, all those results were on um, uh, MNIST, which is, are interesting, but you know, as a vision person, I'm interested in running on sort of real images. Um, the results I'm going to show you, unfortunately, are from a slightly older model. where We, we hadn't quite got the Gaussian pooling at this, working at this point. Um, so, so Matt is currently you know, busy with other things, but he, he's, you know, we don't yet have results on Caltech 101 with the model I described precisely. Um, again, so what we're going to be using here is essentially the max pooling operation, not the, uh, the Gaussian pooling. Um, but the, the rest of the model is essentially the same. Uh, when we trained on Caltech, we just took all the, we took 30 images per class and just threw those in to the model. We didn't use any class labels at all. They were resized to be 150 by 150 pixels. And we did do some pre-processing uh, here, some contrast normalization just to um, beforehand, before presenting to the model. So just to be, sorry, just to be clear here, sorry. The, when we do max pooling, we're just recording location of the max in each region of the unpooled. This is the unpooled map here. This is the pooled map. So we're just recording the location, which lets us, which means we can invert it if needs be. Okay. So, but it's still, it's a local. It's a sort of decision made locally here as to which element we should retain um, in the in the pooled map. In the Gaussian pooling, you know, you're 
that you're using a Gaussian to record what goes on down here, and you're, that's being optimized as part of some global objective function, just to make the difference between the two. So in this model on the Caltech, we had uh, four layers, in fact, 15 feature maps at the first, going up to 150 at the, at the fourth layer. Um, the uh, pooling size was three by three um, all the way up, and then we also actually pulled be between feature maps as well. Um, and then this is the, the sort of hyperparameter setting we had to discover um, for each layer that worked well. Um, in this particular model, the, if you run on the GPU, you can in, do inference for all four layers in about a tenth of a second. Um, in practice, probably we needed to run for more sparse coding iterations. So it, it, it's sort of it's not really quite real time, but it's certainly not impractically slow either. And you can see that as we got the model, the receptive field of each feature goes from being seven by seven up to basically the entire image. And corresponding to the sort of size of the feature maps decreases also. So this is due to the three by three pooling you see here. The, the number of parameters in the filters is fairly small at the lower layers, but is big at the top. The number of sort of latent variables, if you don't want to think about it, in the pooling operate and unpooling operations, um, and the feature maps is a lot at the bottom, but fewer at the top. Okay, so these are what the input images look like after contrast normalization. Um, because we're always optimizing, when we run inference, we're always optimizing for reconstruction of the input. We see that the model reconstructs nicely. Um, this is, you know, so this is taking layer four features and pushing back down to the input of the um, image. And you can see that we don't retain all the fine details, but we still retain the sort of dominant edges and things like that in the model. Um, whoops. So now to just give you a visualization of some of the, the, the things that we learned. So this is the first layer filters. They go bores at different orientations. There's a few blob-like ones, sort of low frequency type things going on. Um, at the second layer, we're going to do this trick, as I, like I was showing you previously, of taking, of taking a whole series of um, new images, inferring up the second layer features, okay? And then we're going to take the strongest activations in a given feature map and then project those back down to pixel space. Because if I just showed you the raw coefficients for the second layer, they wouldn't really make any, they would be unintelligible. So just to be clear, each one of these is, there's not a sample from the model. It's a little piece of image that, that gave a very strong response in a, in a given feature map. And I'm showing you here this little piece of image that gave the strongest response for each of the given feature maps. So there are 50 of them. And then I, I've selected a few of them, and I'm just showing you not just the, the strongest um, response, the patch that gave the strongest response, but the top 25. And you can see um, the kinds of invariants that I was, sh I was showing previously appearing. So essentially, by, because the switches, those, those pooling parameters, can change between you know, the feature and the input signal, the input domain, um, you can get small transformations occurring. In the, you know, so basically, the same feature map uh, responds to slightly different versions of the, of the input structure. So you're getting sort of invariance here to small deformations of the input signal. So you can see, for example, in this case here, you've got a sort of T-junction-like thing, which is, and the position of the T is varying slightly. Sometimes it's a corner. Sometimes it's an actual uh, T-shape, like so. And here you can see the, the sort of curvature of this little curved segment varying. And th these, of course, are being, these, these um, patches are being formed out of sort of compositions of the, feature, of the filters from the layer beneath. OK, so it's using these gabors to sort of you know, make these little structures here. OK, and then you can do the same thing for the third layer. So now you're looking at quite large chunks of the input image. So you're looking at sort of little you know, parts of an object. So for example, you're seeing sort of the back of a chair or something like that. And if you look inside that feature map, you can see that it seems to be this sort of long, this horizontal structure with high frequency vertical lines um, um, near it. Um, or well, this one, for example, here seems to be some kind of horizontal and then diagonal structure. Sometimes it's rounded with sort of with light either side of it. And the top of the model, um, the grouping isn't as strong as we'd like. You do see some grouping arising naturally. So these are actually four different um, different images of octopuses that um, octopi that land in the same feature map. But unfortunately, you see that sometimes you get things which aren't really related. This is some other object. We do get a couple of pianos arriving in the same feature map, but it doesn't happen generally. So um, so obviously, we're sort of working on trying to get sort of better groupings up here, because obviously we want to be able to throw these um, feature maps at this top layer into um, uh, an SVM for recognition. One other fun thing you can do is you can take the input image, you can infer up 
you know, to all four layers of your model, and you can take the strongest activations at the very top of the model and then push those back down to the pixels domain and see what they look like. So here's an example of this person here. So you can see that the five largest activations, one of them seems to like reconstructing his hair and it kind of ignores the rest of the face. And the other ones here reconstruct you know, bits of his nose and eye and also a bit of his hair too. And this one reconstructs his sort of eye and mouth and nose, but basically very little else and so on. Or you can see, for example, this image of a sailing boat. You can see some of them seem to care about the sails of the sailing boat and others just care about the, the sort of hull of the boat and not, nothing else really. Okay, so in other words, you're getting sort of, you know, quite large image structures being um, captured by the model. Um, uh, or rather, it's sort of decomposing this, this rather complicated input image into a, an assembly here of quite high level structures. Um, this is coming from, from the four layer model. Um, we did actually try this um, for classification, so we essentially, it's rather cumbersome how we did it in this, this particular um, set of experiments, but we um, essentially use those top layer features to um, produce features that we could put into um, the, well, a standard classifier. So we use this spatial pyramid matching classifier by uh, Svetlana Lezebnik. Um, and one attraction behind this is that this, many other approaches had used the same classifier. So all the numbers in this table are using the same classification box. All that's changing are the features we're throwing into it. Um, so this is, was the features from our first layer of our model, which was you know, so high 60s, roughly comparable to other convolutional sparse coding approaches, and roughly similar to other um, approaches. So this, was the this is using SIFT, in fact, this original approach here. So it's about 65%. This was Honglak Lee's convolute two layer convolutional RBM. Um, when we use uh, the combination of features from both layer one and layer four, we do actually get slightly over 70%. Um, so this is you know, encouraging. We do seem to get some gain by using these high layer features. But I, it's important to note that this, these numbers now are a bit old. So that the, uh, and they're certainly not competitive with the current state of the art for single feature types. So the, um, the current state of the art is about sort of high 70s on Caltech. Admittedly, Caltech is a bit of a problematic data set because there's so many, so few training examples and um, it's very you know, easy to overfit and so on and so forth. Um, we did try running on uh, Caltech 256. So this is in fact a, the spatial pyramid classifier with um, SIFT features, 29.5. In our, if we use the features from our model, we do beat out the SIF features um, by some margin, not a huge margin. Um, again, this number is no longer, unfortunately, competitive with uh, the state of the art. We did, did try uh, doing a transfer learning. So you can imagine training on Caltech 101, you, taking those filters, running inference on 256, and, seeing how, and then you know, throwing the features into a classifier, and then vice versa. And you'll see, you see that, in fact, the filters we learn do seem to generalize quite well. Um, so um, we, in fact, find that um, basically you get the same performance irrespective of whether you train on 101 or 256. Okay, so uh, the, essentially that's pretty much all I really had to say. So what I've been describing here is a sort of ver a, a version of sparse coding with a, um, a sort of novel form of Gaussian unpooling, which effectively gives you the separation in, into kind of what and where in, at each layer in the model. And the attraction behind sort of doing this is that this, using this Gaussian representation is that it lets you um, essentially um, optimize the pooling as part of an overall objective function. It's no longer just this sort of stage that you bolt between different layers of your model. It now gives you this sort of unified uh, model that you can optimize. And we do find that we get better features in terms of classification and that they're genuinely sparser when we use this, this Gaussian pooling. And as, one, as I was showing in one of the previous slides, running the inference now to infer those um, pooling variables um, at m multiple stages of your model does help performance. In other words, the top-down information really helps you decide what information you should be pushing forward in your model. So if you're, if you're interested to, uh, on, in, this, in this stuff, uh, Matt has put code online, and the, there's a recent sort of archive paper which describes um, the model I've been discussing uh, today in, in more detail. Okay, so that's it. <clears throat>